<laughs> Good evening. My name's John Highbush. I have the honor of being the executive director of the Reagan Presidential Foundation. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Uh, thanks for coming this evening. In honor of our men and women who defend our freedom around the world, if you would please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Great. Please be seated. Okay, uh, Greg, if I could have your attention, Greg. <clears throat> this may come as a surprise to you, but before you arrived here this evening, we conducted a three question survey of all those that came here tonight, most of the people. And the first question we asked as they came through the door was whether or not they wanted to hear a long winded introduction of the Bible. Well, and it would also include the previous bestsellers you've written, the models that you've dated, the super, uh, who, you, you know, who you are wearing, and uh, the fact that you are a star in The Five and uh, in your show on Fox. Now, we had about 700 people here this evening, and only three said that they wanted us to do that. <laughs> okay, so the second question we asked the audience was whether they wanted to spend an evening politely listening to you drone on and on <laughs> in a, in a well-crafted speech. They said that sounded nice, but like so many other speeches, they felt the odds were that by the time they got to their car, they weren't going to remember a word you said. So, <laughs> 17 people voted for that. But when we asked the final question, that is, how many in the audience thought I should just take a seat, briefly interview you, and then let them ask the questions. Well, we had 600 who voted for that. Great. Woo! So, majority rules, but before we begin, and in the interest of full disclosure, we found in that same survey that two, yeah, 227 people thought they were here to see Dana Perino. <laughs> What are, you, what are you going to do? Anyways, ladies and gentlemen, with no further ado, please welcome to the Reagan Library, Mr. Greg Gutfeld. Okay. Here? There. Here. I forgot. Ah. Always with the Dana Perino joke, huh? <laughs> when you can't think of anything, you've got to bring That's up Dana and her Dana dumb Perino. dog. <laughs> lovely dog. Her lovely dog. <laughs> It's not a real dog and we know it. <laughs> Do I have to tell you the whole background of the dog, where it came from, who it really is? <laughs> Kill me, right? <laughs> it uh, is. He has to shave every day before he does Fox and Friends. <laughs> Hairy little man. All right, before we get into the book, uh, it's inevitable. Somebody's going to ask, well, I'm going to ask it anyways, is uh, your take on what happened in Paris? Well, I'd, um, if you, you know, watch my show on Sunday nights, you realized it wasn't on last night. It was preempted. And, um, you know, I spent the weekend basically in a ball of fury, uh, as I always am, actually. <laughs> Nothing was any different. And the attack made it worse. Um, and I had written a uh, monologue for my show. And um, the show was preempted. And I taped it anyway, but, I, but no one has seen it. Uh, because it wasn't aired, except I think it was on uh, uh, Judge Jeanine. But it's, um, I don't know if anybody saw it, but I thought that I would just read you my monologue. <laughs> it's a 70-page haiku. <laughs> and I'm doing it in Esperanto. <laughs> All right, actually, it's fairly serious, but that's why I make jokes, because it's too serious for me to actually fathom it, so that that's why I make jokes. This Paris terror attack reveals a truth many have known, 
but Western leaders have been refusing to admit. We are at war. Instead, we watch those elected to protect us, transfixed by identity politics, fears of Islamophobia, and micro-fractional upticks in Celsius. As I've said before about terror, it's not a wake-up call if you go back to bed. Yeah. It's not enough for temporary promises of solidarity or putting John Lennon's Imagine on repeat. <laughs> it is a war that wants us. We no longer have the choice of talking our way out of it like a skittish hostage in a bank heist. And so, we need four things. First, we need a leader. Someone who... Un <laughs> I'm not used to applause during monologues. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing we need is a leader. Someone who understands the threat is happy to state it by name, and is ready to commit to its destruction. This is someone who understands the adult conclusions that steer national security and surveillance. Someone who understands that freedom and security coexist. They do not clash. This leader must have no truck with Edward Snowden unless he's tied up in the back of it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, libertarian friends, this guy is bad. This is a leader who knows that terror change, which is the increase in mayhem when wed to technology, trumps climate change. Forget climate change, remember terror change. <laughs> and this infantile, urgent global consensus devoted to warming must instead be focused seriously on terror. To track evil, we need coordination, communication, borders, sharing of intel, intel, and leadership that inspires the world. The second thing we need is a people. We need a country that pulls itself out of its self-obsession, its politics of me, we need a unified citizenry, one that finally realizes the pleasant world that they've grown used to denigrating is about to come to an end, unless they act. Three, I went like four, three, and I went four. <laughs> I have an extra, you I always have an extra finger with me. You never know. <laughs> three. <laughs> it's like a stunt finger. Three. <laughs> a media, a sober-minded industry whose priorities are based on authentic but not symbolic concerns. Enough solemn portraits of the whiny co-eds weeping over hurtful words. Imagine if... <laughs> imagine if during World War II, Instead of covering Adolf Hitler, you focused solely on the peekaboo bangs of Veronica Lake. <laughs> That's a reporter amplifying campus crybabies over Islamic terror. They're missing the story of their lives. And it will cost them their lives. Four, a defense. Four, a defense. I'm not talking about a national defense. That goes without saying. We should have the strongest, greatest, you know it. Nor do I mean gun, gun ownership, which also, by the way, goes without saying. Let us not forget that the cops usually en end up arriving there after it's already happened. We need to protect ourselves. The kind of defense, <laughs> the kind of defense that I am talking about is, an, is a new education, a mentality in schools that teaches self-defense needed when terror or mass shooting strike. We must make our soft targets harder through security, barriers, and most of all, mentality. We have to think differently. I say this, by the way, not to judge others' responses when it comes to terror. I have no idea how I might act. But regarding my own personal need to change my own behavior, as a citizen, I have to play a role in knowing how to stop something awful. The cops can't be everywhere, so it is up to all of us to be like that vendor in New York 
who stopped a car bombing in Times Square. We all have to be that person. Um, the word would be <laughs> vigilance, but I came up with a new word called vigilance, which is <laughs> vigilance in your village. <laughs> I'm beginning to se have second thoughts about that word. <laughs> but the fact is SWAT teams and the military, they burst into buildings knowing that one of their own might die. And the passengers on flight 93, they did the same thing. They did it because they knew ultimately that that was their only choice they had left. And they did it for the betterment of a country. They saved, who knows, thousands of lives. So it's time that we accept that choice as a country because it is the only choice we have left. And that was my monologue. Mm -hmm. Okay, Greg, so one question related to the topic. Uh, you know, I, as everyone knows, or I'm sure you must know, in the last two days, the media has been reporting that one of the terrorist attackers uh, slipped his way in through the refugee flow uh, coming from uh, Eastern Europe and the Mideast. Um, and Obama just said yesterday that we should not, quote, somehow start equating the issue of refugees with the issue of terrorism. Mm -hmm. And I, I just want to get your take on that, given that, uh, according to the president, we should be obligated to take tens of thousands of such refugees. It's always that reflex that he relies upon when something like this happens. However, that reflex is missing when it comes to gun crime. It's when there is an act of gun violence, it's not like he says, whoa, let's not go after all people with guns. He does the precise opposite. He becomes this strident superhero about gun control, but he, has, he doesn't have that same emotion and strength when it comes to terror control. Terror control to me is more important than gun control because gun control generally targets people who are law-abiding citizens and we are about targeting violent people who want to end our life. Look, I am, I am for an open society and a strong border. The metaphor that I always use is, you know, when you, you, you can't sneak into Disneyland. I've tried. I try, I try to tell them that I'm like uh, one of the employees at It's a Small World. <laughs> but, they, uh, but I'm too short. But you can't sneak into Disneyland. There's a gate, there are walls, you can't get in. America is the Earth's Disneyland. Everybody wants to come to this magical kingdom. And who can blame them? I mean, I, if you, if I was, I, I'm lucky that I was born here. If I was born in Pakistan or Syria or hell, Canada. <laughs> and I love, and I love Canada. I love Canada. What I'm saying is I don't blame people for wanting to come here. But that does not, uh, uh, make us, uh, force us to relinquish any responsibility about our security, about looking at the people that are coming here. You can have both. The, the greatest people in this country come from other places, and some of the worst people in the world are born here. Let's face it. I would like to trade a few. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to think offhand how many people we could get for Keith Olbermann. <laughs> uh, but anyway. <laughs> My point is, the border for us is just like a fence around Disneyland. It just makes perfect sense if there are people that are climbing the fence to get in, you find them, you find a way, you look at them, you figure it out. It's obviously more difficult than that. Uh, but you have a process. And without a process, what you're seeing is what's happening now in, in Europe. You have open borders and they don't know what to do. I mean, it's, it's, it's terrifying how many people might be there who wish harm on their country. You have an invading army now. You have an invading force that is blended into the community. Um, and God forbid, you know, you voice any alarm about it. I was watching MSNBC, not by choice. It's mysterious how at every gym in New York, that's the only thing that's on. <laughs> they let off an hour of news with online backlash against migrants. And I'm thinking, oh God, I wish that was our problem. 
I wish that our problems were online. <laughs> I wish our violence and our death and the mayhem that we incur every day or every month was online. I mean, how insidious. My God, they're saying horrible things about you online. <laughs> yes, because of this terrorist attack, we need to discuss your feelings because they're saying bad things about you on a message board. <laughs> I know, it's, it's a, we have therapists nearby. <laughs> That's not a problem. That is not a problem. But we're living in a world where that is almost perceived as an equal problem as the actual physical threats to our lives. On campus, they are equated. That words are now uh, seen as violent. We have conflated words with actions. It's crazy. It's crazy. I think about, you know, at Reagan Library, and I was saying this to my buddy on the way over here, how would Ronald Reagan figure this out? Like, how would he, if, I mean, I mean he, he would figure out ISIS. He would figure that out pretty clearly, but how would he figure out the, the native opposition, the opposition here? How could he stomach the idiocy from the people that are here telling us that we must meet hatred with love and that we must worry about, you know, we must worry about how we articulate our outrage as opposed to responding to evil? I don't know what he would do. It would be just like Bill and Ted's ex excellent adventure. <laughs> When they show up and they're like, George Washington's like, what the hell happened? But this is only 30 years ago. How much has changed? Yeah. A good movie. <laughs> Second one, not so good. Um, you know, having read your book, you... Thank you for that. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> um, By the way, one th important thing about the book, there, as you notice, there is absolutely no cloth or paper cover. So that means if you take it on the, on the airplane, people see what you're reading. <laughs> you, can't, you can't take it off <laughs> and hide it. <laughs> I know what you do. Go ahead, sorry. <laughs> well, you come right out in the book and you say, look, this book is all about uh, making you better at saying what you think. And so then I, as I read it, it was kind of like a self-help manual in a way. Yeah. And I, I just wondered if, um, you know, is it just conservatives are too tongue-tied? They just can't seem to get their arguments across? What's your sense of I have that? no idea what you're talking about. Yes, you do. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, uh, there's so many ways to go. First of all, it is a service book. I mean, I come from a background of service. I worked at Men's Health. And, you know, in the 90s, during that horrible time when all you read about were abs, that was me. <laughs> you know, uh, three steps to flatter abs, you're welcome. <laughs> all those headlines was made by four guys in a room who wanted to kill themselves <laughs> for five years. So it is a self-help book. It's based on a couple of premises. Number one, whenever I do book signings and stuff, people ask me how I do my monologues and the goal of my monologues on the five because they like those things. And they like them, I think, because I take an idea that ticks me off that might be kind of complicated and I try to boil it down into 80 seconds. Uh, so that I can, one persuasive point in that monologue that allows you it's like I gave you a rhetorical weapon in case this comes up. So every day, like it can't just be something that I find funny or upsetting. In that monologue, I have to have something in there that you can use that's serviceable. So when it comes up in a conversation, it's there. It could be a statistic. It could be a moral reason for the belief. But it has to be, if I'm not giving you that thing, then I've failed. And people ask me how, how I do that, and I thought it would be a great book idea to explain how you're able to persuasively be correct rather than just be correct. Because the thing that drives me nuts is I have plenty of friends in which I agree with, we, we agree on everything, but the way they articulate it makes me not want to agree with it. They take a, a fairly you know, cogent point, but they get angry or emotional or they don't attach facts or reason to it and they ruin it. And that's, this happens a lot with immigration. And immigration is a winnable uh, issue for us, not when it's married to nativism. Um, and so it, it, what I, my goal is to strip away shrill anger and emotion from our arguments. I would be a hypocrite if I were angry and emotional because I, that's the thing I always make fun of liberals about. Conservatives aren't supposed to be angry or shrill. They're supposed to be sharp and prepared and funny. And I think that we need more humor 
And that's why, the, why I wrote the book. The other reason why I wrote the book is, um, and I say it, I think, in the first chapter, I say that the left is really good at selling deadly ideas, and the right is really bad at selling great ideas. And I don't know if it's the right's fault, because I think the ideas are so great that they work. And when a great idea works, you forget about it. So we take it for granted, we, whether it is law and order, police. I mean, like, we, let's face it. The reason why there's this reaction against police isn't over just simply police brutality. It's because we've become used to this amazing, dramatic advance in crime reduction. For the last 30 years, we've seen a reduction in violent crime like we've never seen. It is only when you have uh, these long periods of success that you are able to rip apart the things that bring you success. And that is why conservatives have a hard time. Like we, you know, what makes, what frees countries, free markets, capitalism, individual opportunity. We have no need to explain it because we think it's natural and because it's working. Meanwhile, we have a socialist running for president. How can that be after a century of socialist hell or present day Venezuela where toilet paper costs as much as a suit? made of toilet paper. <laughs> Ask me how I know uh, later. But anyway, my point is this. Only in contemporary society can socialism be romanticized and capitalism be demonized when capitalism has freed billions and billions of people and socialism has imprisoned so many. You know, the one theme that seems to run through almost all of your chapters, Greg, is that uh, conservatives don't do their homework. Or, you know, there's an obligation to do homework. And what do you mean by that? I think, you know what, I, I, it's not that they don't do their homework. They have to do more homework. Um, global warming is a good example. Because uh, you're, if you are skeptical about what you've been told. See, my, my skepticism of global warming isn't about science because I read this stuff. I read it constantly, and I behoove you to find the experts and read this stuff so that when you are faced with that kind of uh, conflict, that, that argument that you have, the data that suggests a pause or the slight increases are, are, could be a, a rounding error or a percent, you know, uh, just a, a tiny incremental, like, uh, what do you call it, a percent of, uh, you know, it could just be a percent of error uh, that you get in, in science um, with all studies. It is important that you have the data so that you can argue, and you don't have to argue with emotion, you can argue with a smile, with data points and stats, and it's actually a lot of fun to have that with you. So I think it's, I think it's very important. I don't think we are less, I don't think we're less prepared. It says that we have to be more prepared because the left doesn't have to be prepared. Remember, the left argues from the, the arena of compassion that they care more than you do. And you have to have the facts that show that their beliefs are actually more harmful than yours. That your, you can show that their belief in a welfare system is actually more dangerous. And you can show that over the last four or five decades that we've seen uh, uh, cities falling apart. That the cities that are in the biggest trouble are run by liberal mayors. You can show that liberal policies are painful to people. Um, you have that as, as, as your fact base and you can't lose. Yeah. You wrote, uh, with a really neat twist, uh, I'll quote you directly, you said, when a liberal asks you, why are you a conservative, simply state, so you can be a liberal. And what, what do you mean by that? That's like, um, that's the end of a, of a chapter where I was trying to, trying to show people how to explain why, why they're conservatives, because you're always gonna have a friend, especially in college, who says, how can you be a conservative? Ooh, those Republicans, ugh, they're like, they're stodgy, they wear ties, and they own 40 pairs of khakis, and they eat babies. <laughs> Half of that is true. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, the point is, in order for a liberal to get what he wants, a conservative has to build something. And I think I use the example of minimum wage. <laughs> it's like you have, uh, you know, you have these people demanding, you know, I want min $15 minimum wage, but they weren't there when you were starting your business. So you need a conservative to decide to start a small business, to hire people, to sleep on the floor 
while he's trying to not even make a profit, just trying to break even. He's not even taking a salary. He's putting a, a, he's hiring people to work in this little restaurant. Finally, this restaurant is kind of thriving, and he might, he might make a profit. And then this person shows up and says, we demand an increase in minimum wage. And he's like, well, wait, I, where were you? I've been doing this for, I've been, I, I took 10 years. These people are happy. If they don't want to work here, they don't have to work here. He goes, no, we demand it. That equation can't happen in reverse. The person has to build the business, work his ass off, hire the people in order for the liberal to come in and demand their cut. I say the left is basically, they're the mafia in Priuses. You know, they, <laughs> but, Liberalism is the barnacle on the conservative boat. <laughs> all, the, all of the principles that you, that you have from the moment you wake up in the morning to, the, to going to bed are absolute. They're objective. They're not relative. They're, when, when, you're trying to make, when you're trying to do your job, there are standards uh, that, you, that you follow. There's no namby-pamby liberalism in, or how you feel when you're trying to build a car or write a song. A song has a distinct melody and it has notes. Uh, when you're a chef, you have a recipe. And if the recipe isn't followed, the food is terrible. You have to make it, everybody has to make it right. Those are conservative principles which are completely sacrificed when that person who is a chef or a musician steps out of his profession and starts thinking about politics. He just divorces himself from it. He has no idea that none of, the, none of these liberal beliefs would exist if it wasn't for the conservatism that you put inside your daily life every day to make things work. I mean, you know, you know the best way to get to work every morning. You know, a liberal's like, well, who's to say that's the best way? <laughs> I mean, it's like, you know, you could go, I mean, like, that's kind of really rude. What about the other ways? Like, when you say you're going to take that way, the other ways, and like, has, I mean, that's like... That's like totally violating my safe space. <laughs> when you say, okay, it takes you 11 minutes to get to work this way, and it takes 45 minutes, and you're saying that's better just because it's shorter? <laughs> I mean, where? I don't understand that. I mean, so it takes three times as long to get to work, and you're going to be late, but why is that worse? That's how, that's what happens if you applied liberal thinking to actual life, that's how life would be. You would never be able to make judgments. I mean, imagine baking a cake from a liberal, like, you know, uh, uh, why that? Why can't I put more sugar in that? Well, it's gonna, I wanna cook it for 10 minutes. Let's see what happens. I don't even know what that, I don't even know what that voice is. It's a good one. I think I channeled, uh, I don't know who I channeled there. It was Reagan from The Exorcist, not Ronald Reagan. Yeah, the other one. The yeah. other Reagan. Um, I, when I read this in the book, I thought, that's it. I figured out, finally, what makes you as interesting and uh, the, um, the five more than anything else. And you, you, I'll quote, you said, my simple, perhaps sole tactic has always been to extend liberal beliefs to absurd levels. I push the obvious until the argument can only tip in my favor. And it, uh, explain that. Yeah, um, I, you know, it's funny, because I, um, I like answered, that was, I just, I just did that with the, it's like, yeah. I, I'm trying I to think of, um, oh, geez, there was a really good one in the book uh, that I used. Um, <laughs> what chapter are you on? <laughs> um, well, for example, uh, animal rights. Uh, one of the first articles I ever wrote was for the San Francisco Chronicle in 1989. After I'd been to an, I went to an animal rights uh, concert, and I guess it was the B-52s or something in D.C., and I started thinking about living th beings, and I started thinking, well, I wrote a whole thing on bacteria rights, that if things are alive, you shouldn't clap at all because there are things floating, and I came up with all these new rules <laughs> uh, to dictate 
uh, not killing anything that is alive around you. Also, I found this interesting study that said that certain produce gives off an unusual stench as it's being cooked. And I think that's a lot like people. I mean, it's like, you know, when you're scared or in fear, what do you do? Let's be honest. So broccoli, broccoli is crapping in its pants, knowing that you're going to cook it. I mean, that's kind of inhuman that you would eat broccoli rather than a chicken. I mean, what, why? Because a chicken can move and broccoli can't? I think that's movist. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, do you think if broccoli had feet, it would try to get away? Of course it would. <laughs> of course it would, but it can't run because it doesn't have any feet. So you are a killer of broccoli. The, the point is, is like we're high on the food chain. This is what people high, you know, high in the food. By the way, this is not to say you should be cruel to animals. I, I often think, go back and forth about, about meat while eating it. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but when people talk about inhumanity, I mean, like being, me, being inhumane, uh, they are eating living things. So I, you, you, you take the animal rights to its furthest territory, which would be vegetable rights. It's going to happen. <laughs> And, I mean, I, like, I think I, you know, even, with, even with identity, the fact that now we can self-identify. Uh, we had a, a white female activist claim that she was black. We had a white male activist claim that he was black. I think it was in Black Lives Matter or something like that. I can't remember. Yes. And uh, so, I mean, why, what stops us? I, I want to... I, why can't I be, I don't know, an aboriginal unicorn? What is keeping me from self-identifying? Because, because right now your feelings trump fact in the world of identity. No one can tell you what you can't be. And I mean, so why not just take that and we all self-identify as whatever we want? Because in the end, what, that, what that'll do is that'll completely deflate the movement and turn it into the joke that it is. Mm -hmm. And I am a unicorn. <laughs> uh, let's go to the audience. Um, if you have a question, if you could raise your hand, but don't ask the question until we have a microphone in front of you. Some things are off limits. Nothing about dogs. Hmm? Well, nothing about a dog. <laughs> okay. By the way, I had a dog named Jasper, so she had totally ripped me off. Right over here. Does this work? Okay. Good evening, Mr. Gottfeld. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Strange seeing you here again. <laughs> yes. It has been many years. No, it's only been since March. I thought you March. said you'd never come here. <laughs> it's only been since March of 2013. Ah, well, close enough. <laughs> Give right. us your question and be gone. <laughs> I'll do that. Right, uh, my name is Catherine Roche. Uh, yes. My family owns a bed and breakfast. And being from California, going to Santa Monica College, I'm surrounded by a lot of people that are very ignorant of the world's problems. Mm -hmm. And then at the end itself, we find a lot of guests that they just, they don't want to believe that politics can be any good, that they like say they won't vote or all politicians are liars. And my question is, it seems that a lot of people in America, it's like this fad that's come over them to where they're all ignorant of the world's problems. They don't want to admit that there is evil. And then all the young people, they're also frustrated about things that don't matter. So my question is, do you think it will pass or it's the beginning of a bigger problem? Hmm. Um, I think it might have always been like this, but we don't know because we're living in this now. Yesterday, trending on Twitter was MTV stars. I don't even know what it is. But that was a day after the Paris attacks. It was the number one trending thing. And today, when I was looking on Twitter, every single trending item, which basically reflects what people, I mean, Twitter to me is a bathroom wall uh, for the vacuous, which is why I enjoy it. Um, <laughs> but it is. Uh, but I like to go on there just to yell and scream at, at the world. But every single item there was not about Paris. And I think politics doesn't become part of your life until it actually affects your life. It's, the, it's like nobody understands taxes until they see it taken out of their check. 
you know, and then, and then suddenly they're a Republican. It's so funny. <laughs> it's why, it's why, it's why you become a Republican later in life because, you know, it, it drives me crazy. Uh, I'm going to go off on a tangent here, but the, um, somebody accused, somebody on the five who was in the, in the left uh, seat, uh, I, I, they all blend. Uh, Geraldo Beckel. But uh, no, they, uh, they said something like, oh, Greg, you know, easy, we were talking about t uh, taxes and economic inequality. And they said, oh, but you, Greg, you're loaded. And I go, what? I, I go, wait a minute, I'm, I'm 51 years old. So I'm thinking about this, about like, you know, this is the fallacy that people have on the left that people who are conservatives or Republicans just somehow blossom into money. They're just rich. It's like, we're just rich. We didn't spend 30 years climbing a ladder and doing really dirty work to get where we were. You know, I, when I was in my early 20s, my, I, I can remember my salary at American Spectator, it was $12,000 a year. That was like a, a take home of like 700 bucks a month. My first, at, at prevention, it was 22.5. Then at men's health, it was like in its 30s. It wasn't until about 2000 that I started making some actual money. And the government didn't care about me until I started making real money. I didn't exist. And now I'm hated. It was, it's as though when you're wealthy, it's like no one, unless you're born into it, most people who make money made it after years and years of hard work. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you have a right to complain about it. You have a right to complain about it because you have the history behind you that got you there. It's like when people say, oh, shut up. You know, there are people out there that are, are struggling. You say, yeah, that, that was me. I was struggling. We were all struggling once. And I'm trying to tell you, I'm an example of how to get out of that. Anyway, did I answer that question? Perhaps. Uh, it was a good answer. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, over here. Hi, Mr. Gunfield. Love Hi. you on the five. <laughs> Hello. How are you? Good. Um, yeah. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. Uh, my son actually goes to UC Merced, and they had a stabbing there um, not too long ago. Mm -hmm. um, the stabber was shot and killed on campus. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, of course, it, he used a knife, so it wasn't too much of a, um, not a lot of people heard about it because it wasn't a gun. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, but my question is, you know, they jump on the gun bandwagon whenever something like this happens. Um, when are people gonna start talking about mental illness and what do you think about the mental illness problem we have in, in our country and why it's not being taken care of properly? That's a, there's a lot there's a lot of ways you can go with that because um, there's different kinds of mental illness and I'm not sure if it's mental illness that is leading to these shootings if you look at the if you look at the statistics these shootings aren't on a rise I, I, I always cite John Lott Jr. as a person to look and look at these different spree shootings and attacks it could be because of I have friends who believe it has to do with over medication um, I'm not I don't know about that but I look at the statistics and I wonder if it's just because we, here, here's my feeling on this. We are creating um, copycat crimes through, the, through media attention of things. When uh, the police, when there's, let's say there's a, a teen suicide, the police usually urges the press in that area not to cover it because it, it creates a copycat effect. Autoerotic asphyxiation, which is this you know, perverse act uh, that would pop up now and then. They don't talk about it because they don't want people to do it. These are things that you don't do, uh, you don't cover for fear that it might be replicated. It's something we completely suspend when it comes to these shootings. When you look at a lot of these spree killers, what you find is their obsession with previous spree killers. Uh, they always find that they have a scrapbook that they are obsessed with the, the guy that got the most victims. This is a regular thing. And I'll, always on the five, when I talk about this, I say that the media is complicit in this, in this business because we immediately stop everything and we focus all of our attention on that. And that is the reward. That is the reward to the person seeking uh, attention in his lonely, alienated, horrible life. 
Uh, this is what a loser does. A loser says, oh my God, I can get attention by taking out all these people. And that's what he does. And we still give them the attention. So I feel that it's a, com it's a combination of factors. Having said that, I don't think we do enough for uh, the people who are mentally ill. I think we've let people out of uh, institutions and not, and, and by virtue of, of, of rights, said it is not incumbent on us to help them uh, because it is their right to roam the streets and be sick. Uh, as somebody who lives in New York and sees it, it's a horrible thing. We need to help these people. Um, and putting them in prison isn't the right way to do it. Mm. Over here. Hello. Hi. Um, I grew up in San Mateo. And Congratulations. I went, and I went what to street? What yeah. street? I lived near Aragon High School. Uh, I used to run by Aragon. I lived by Ilsa High School. Okay. Aragon played a lot of soccer there. Had good tennis courts, too, I remember. <laughs> I don't anyway, think, thank you for your question. I don't think soccer... <laughs> You're welcome. By the way, I never really liked Aragon. Although, Car didn't Carlos Santana go there? No. Yes, he did. <laughs> Neil Sean went there. Neil Sean from Journey went there. There you go. Carlos Santana also went there, I'm pretty certain. Well, that was before my time, I think. Well, you know what? Your time is up, sir. <laughs> thank you. So, Aragon is responsible for Journey. I just want you to know that. Yeah. At least it's not Starship. I, and, and I also went to Berkeley. Ah! So, my, my, my question is, <laughs> how, how When did, did you graduate? You, uh, I graduated in 1974. Ah, well, all right. From you Berkeley. weren't there when I was there. Yeah. No. How did you grow up in a place like that, go to a college like that, and be in an environment where all of the thought was left-wing thought and get to your current level of wisdom? <laughs> uh, copious amount of pharmaceuticals. <laughs> um, actually, it's easy to be a liberal when you're young because it's just like being in high school. All the romantic notions are not based on fact, they're in this kind of cloud of emotion. So it's very easy to be a liberal when you're in high school, which I kind of was. And I was probably a liberal loudmouth even at that because I was just as obnoxious as I am now, <laughs> but I was a liberal. Um, and I also, you didn't have to think that much about it. I, uh, I had uh, worked for the nuclear freeze, I've talked about this before, briefly in order to get extra credit for a class at Sarah High School, that meant getting signatures for the nuclear freeze, which was, uh, you know, it was, it was to ban the transport of nuclear weapons in California. So this is like in the like late 70s, early 80s. And I did it just, I didn't even really care. I just did it because I wanted to get, they could move a, you know, a B to a B plus, a half a grade, if on a Sunday you stood out in front of a church and you took signatures. And I did that, and I didn't, but I didn't think about it. And it was also easy, as a it's easy to be a liberal when you're young, because all you have to say is war is bad and love is good and why can't we all live in peace? Because you don't, as a young person, you never have to connect a dot. It's not incumbent upon you to connect a dot. You just have to say one thing and then everybody goes, oh, isn't that sweet? But I got to Berkeley as kind of a liberal and, and within, I guess, like I'd say like six to 12 weeks, uh, had completely switched because I was at the finish line of liberalism. I saw what my beliefs had created and it stunk. <laughs> and I don't mean metaphorically. There were some definite <laughs> hygiene problems going on <laughs> on Bancroft and Durant, um, as you well know. There, 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 even after that, it got worse. There were people living in the trees in Berkeley. That's how bad it got. You can't get people out of your trees because that would be wrong. They were living, they were tree people, people. Um, but that, but what's funny, and, and I think that, you know what's interesting about when you're young, you have no idea that there's another side. There was no other side because we never talked about politics in my, in my home. We had, you know, we had ABC, CBS, NBC, and this thing called PBS, which I watched uh, for Monty Python, but there were other things on there that were kind of strange. But anyway, you didn't have any idea that there was other things out there. I didn't know there was a thing called conservatism. I just knew that there was this mainstream liberal thought, and I didn't even call it liberal, it was just the way things were, uh, until I, a friend of mine, uh, Patrick Fleischer, gave me 
He was subscribing to the American Spectator, which was this oversized magazine, and National Review. And there was a section in National Review uh, in the middle, which I think was called This Week. And then in the, there was a back of the American Spectator, which was called Current Wisdom. And they were both like little chunky things of humor. And Current Wisdom was stuff that was pulled out of other liberal magazines that they put a funny headline on. And then This Week was just kind of riffs on ridiculous stuff. And I started reading this and I go, my God, this is weird. Like they're making fun of stuff that nobody's making fun of and it's okay to make fun of it. And that, it blew my mind and it blew my mind so quickly that I applied like two years later at the NJC, National Journalism Center, to be an intern at uh, the American Spectator uh, in Arlington, Virginia. Um, and that, it, it, it just, it, op it was like somebody opened a window in your brain and said, get out get out of where you are, come with us, they're crazy. Um, all it took though was another side, I, 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 somebody, somebody to show me that there was something else out there. You just need that one person who can do that and do it in a good way, in a friendly way, not in a pushy way. And that was what my buddy did. He was, I just was like, what is that? It was such a funny looking magazine. I don't know if you remember the American Spectator in those days, but it was this kind of oversized yeah. tabloidy looking yeah. thing yeah. with weird uh, illustrations. Yeah. And it had all these amazing writers like PJ O'Rourke and Joe Queenan and Tom Wolfe. And it was uh, uh, really, an, it really was an influence. Good, over here. Hi, Greg. Um, this is Elizabeth Brown. We used to work together at Men's Health. Oh, Remember? my God. Yes. I can. I can yeah, yeah. I used, I used to Still working out, I see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I used, I used to make 23000 back then. So I, I was, remember. I was making more than I remember you, you at the Energy Center. Yeah. Working out. You were, teach, yeah. you were teaching aerobics, weren't you? No, I taught nutrition classes. That's right. And you gave me my Kitchen Vixen name which oh. I still use, thank you. Kitchen Vixen? Yes. <laughs> and, um, so it's my a question... collection of strange videos. You can only get them in Germany. <laughs> no. no, we did an interview together for Men's Health and you said, oh, you should be like something sexy like the Kitchen Vixen or something, so anyway. That's the kind of wisdom you would get from me. <laughs> but, um... You should be, uh, you're pretty hot, be the Kitchen Vixen. <laughs> no, but it was a good interview, it was a good magazine, good Terrible article. now. But anyway, I lost track of you after that. You went to Maxim, and then you ended up on Fox News. So I want to know how you made the transition to all those different venues. Huh. Well, it's interesting because most of the stuff in my career I didn't plan on, which I always think is a great piece of advice, is that if you just keep move forward and you work hard, sooner or later you're going to end up where you're supposed to be. What I do on Fox News is no different than what I did in the editorial meetings at Men's Health, which was I would sit there with a group of people and we would talk about the issues of the day that we would put in the magazine and I would sit there and crack jokes. That is mapped on the things I did in high school in the back of comb room where I would just make, great, make jokes and be stupid. Who knew that I ended up creating a profession out of being a wise ass? But it's, it, but it's like that's, it's like you don't, I don't, like the transition was more like, I guess, kind of like the world kind of found out where I was as I kept moving. I, I mean, if you think about how it happened, it's very strange. I mean, I was at Maxim in London, and the reason why Fox found me was because of me agreeing to do the Huffington Post uh, because Matt Labash, who was a writer, said he couldn't do it, so he hooked me up with Ariana. Ariana asked me, then I got to know Andrew Breitbart, who was working. Remember, Andrew Breitbart, he launched the Huffington Post. A lot of people forget that. And we get, that's how we became, you know, really close. And then he told people about me. And then I met a guy uh, in a bar. It sounds weird. Uh, from Fox. I had to end that sentence. I met a guy at a bar from Fox to talk about a show. And that's how it happened. So it's these things where you kind of like fall forward into these things. And that's how I ended up at Red Eye and then The Five. And, uh, but it wasn't like it wasn't active pers career pursuit. It's just something that naturally happens if you keep saying yes to work. Yeah, yeah. Um, in fact, you cover exactly that in your book about... That is true. There's an entire chapter on my resume. Yes, right. Which I will read right now. No, but it's, a, <laughs> but it's that because it's like I decided to figure out like a lot of people, a lot of People like me, when I was young, I didn't know what I was doing and I didn't know how to get to where I was going. It was really miserable. And so I tried to figure out by tracing my steps how it's possible to get from A to Z. 
because uh, everybody wants to get to A to Z. They don't want to get A to B to C. They don't want the steps. I'm talking about when you're young, when you're in your 20s, you want the thing right then, but you don't know how to get there, and you don't realize there are all these steps in between that you should be doing and be happy you're doing it, and, and take a breath and, not, and not, uh, not think that it's a race, because I thought it was a race. I was constantly thinking that it was a race until I, until I got to the... Got, happy and figured out what it was, which is you just work. Yeah. Over here. Hi, Greg. Hi. Uh, my wife and I discovered you late one night at about 2 a.m. on a show called Red Eye in hmm. 2008. I thought you were going to say it at a certain parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> we discovered you at 2 a.m. late at night in a parking lot. You weren't wearing any clothes. <laughs> one of your uh, frequent guests back then was Andrew Breitbart. Yeah. And um, I noticed that uh, the two of you really had a lot in common. Uh, not only were you able to dismantle the fallacy of progressivism and do it with a sense of humor, but you guys also had pretty good taste in music. And I'm just wondering, you both started off as liberals, and I, you know, did that have something to do with it? Were you, were you pretty happy that you came from that background and got the cultural side of that? And, and if so, I'm also curious in your opinion, what were your... What are your three most underrated bands of the 1980s? <laughs> Ooh. You can't say the cramps. Uh, that yeah. takes, that's the, the <laughs> if you take away the cramps. Okay, I'll give you a second to think about it. All right. But I also wanted to know, um, also, if, can you tell us a bit more about Andrew on the personal side? Because we miss him a ton. Yeah. And When you talk about what, that when you answer that question, you have to be, there is, uh, that, that inevitably creates some criticism that is necessary about conservatives in general uh, that we have to admit. And that is, we are conservative and we are repulsed by crass uh, pop culture. Uh, even though within crass pop culture, there's some really awesome stuff. And we have to stop rejecting that sort of thing, uh, because it, it, it's, it's actually good. And I think that's what you're getting. It's like, well, Andrew and I were both into subversive music, and we, and we, and we loved the same TV shows. And, we, and you'd run into conservatives that, were, are like I, where, where I work, that aren't familiar with a lot of the music that I listen to or, or a lot of the movies that I see. Um, and it's not their fault. It's just that there's a natural inclination to resist things that are risky. And I talk about it in my book that the left tends to tends to be uh, 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 take more risks in all areas, whether it is uh, pop culture, uh, um, sex, drugs, you name it, except for business. They don't take risks with business. Right. That's on the right. But the right is more conservative. So they so they're more interested in more traditional types of music and traditional forms of entertainment. And I believe that that has to change that uh, Andrew always said that politics is downstream from pop culture, or from culture. And he's right. Uh, if you see the way the world works, if you, can master, if you can master the culture, you can master politics. And I think that's why President Obama has been so successful among, the, among young people, is that he speaks their language. Oddly, I think Trump has that in a way as well. Um, uh, his pros are also his cons. He has very strong pros, and they're also is really bad cons. And I talk about this a lot, but the one thing he has is he has a cocoon around him that is, that is from pop culture. He's an entertainer. So he can get away with saying things that other politicians can't say because he goes, hey, I'm an entertainer. This is what I do. I say, I say things. What am I going to do? And people go, yeah, it's Trump. <laughs> Maybe that's not so bad. Maybe, if, maybe it doesn't hurt to have a politician who's immune to the same hypersensitivities that they've used against all our politicians for so long. In a weird way, he has kind of the Obama immunity. Obama had the immunity for being a historical first, that if you went after him about his issues or lack of experiences, you were branded a bigot. So he had this incredible cocoon around him that allowed him to make it to the White House. And it helped that he was articulate and charming and smart. And actually, I have to say, he's funny. Uh, he mastered the world of pop culture. Trump kind of does that now. Um, to your point, though, it is important, that as Breitbart and I, and I talked about endlessly, that we have to, we have to invade pop culture. We have, to be the, we have to join bands if you're young. 
You have to write for magazines. You have to get involved. You can't separate yourself. You've got to go in there so people know you. As for three underrated 80s bands, <laughs> um, oh, gee whiz. Well, uh, I like Gang of Four, even though they're communists. Um, but I, I listen to them a lot. Um, I'm going to hate my answer. But Wire, I love Wire, uh, another British band. Uh, let's pick a, and I just say X from LA. There you go. Last year, uh, Billy Zoom was here at the, at, the, uh, at the Reagan Library, if you're a fan of X, the band. <laughs> Great. Uh, up here in the balcony? Yeah, that's one of those. Hi, my name is Nicholas, and I'm in sixth grade, mm -hmm. and my question is... How tall am I? <laughs> <laughs> you're, yeah, Nicholas, you're already taller, I get it. <laughs> Uh, my friends like Bernie Sanders, but I want them to like Ben Carson, so what do I do? <laughs> do the uh, deserted island uh, question that I always do, which is, okay, imagine that you're on a plane, and you're either on a plane with Bernie or Ben, and the plane goes down. Well, you're the only survivors. So you're on this desert island. Or is it deserted island or desert island? It's deserted <laughs> island. It's deserted. I go back and forth on this. It's deserted island. It's not a desert island. Because some islands don't have deserts. So it has to be a deserted island. Anyway, deserted island, Ben Carson. Deserted island, Bernie Sanders. Deserted island, Bernie Sanders. We're going to... Whatever we find, we're going to split equally. Uh, we got to, like, listen to each other. We got to do that. Well, do you have any skills? No. Uh, you're on this deserted island with Ben Carson. Um, might have some extremely conservative views about gays. Might have some very, very religious views that you might find different. But he can operate on you if you fall on a sharp object. <laughs> Who do you want? Who do you want on a deserted island? Somebody who knows how to do something and has spent decades figuring out how to do something that is life-saving or somebody who's been running for office since 1972. <laughs> <laughs> oh, That's a good, actually, that deserted, uh, deserted island metaphor uh, you could probably use uh, with any right or left, I think. Except for Howard Dean, because he's a doctor. <laughs> last question. I shouldn't have we allowed have, that. <laughs> yeah, we have time for one last question. You take it, sir. First of all, I want to thank you for being here at the Reagan Library. Thank you and, for having me. Uh, also, Reagan, being what I feel was one of the greatest presidents in modern history, um, my question to you is, can you tell me with any specific uh, person running for Republican can candidate uh, or the top few who you think would be the best and also, excuse my French, beat the liar that's running on the other side. How dare you call Martin O'Malley a liar? <laughs> <laughs> this is a very weird time, let's face it. You're watching governors who in their titles say govern, <laughs> and they're not, they're not winning. I mean, it's amazing. That is in, that's the definition of your occupation, is to govern. If you look at Florida, if you look at Texas, uh, these are bigger than most countries, and we are not impressed anymore by this. I'm not sure that's healthy. I think that we owe governors a chance to explain their successes. And, 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 and this gets, I, I may not answer your question, but I will say this. I am sick and tired of the, uh, the I'm more conservative than you are mentality. It's driving me crazy. The name calling has got, like, it, 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 this seems to me relatively new. I don't remember this under Reagan. You had, sure, you had annoying liberal Republicans like Bob Packwood. You know, you had 
uh, Specter. Arlen Specter, you had liberal Republicans, but you knew they were liberal Republicans. We got it. Not everybody in your party is a liberal Republican because they disagree with you on 10% of the issues. You know, there, I don't know who said it. It might have been Reagan. It might have been Reagan who said, like, uh, if, you, if we disagree 25% of the time, you're 75% of the time with me. And that's, that's how it should be. And I think it's really dangerous that we are... Um, in this weird competition amongst ourselves to prove who's more right than, than you know, it, it is weird. Calling people a rhino serves no purpose. Um, I think it's <laughs> tepid applause. The, the rest of everybody are going, damn rhino. <laughs> Typical rhino. <laughs> Typical rhino would say that. <laughs> Probably voting for Jeb. <laughs> Rhino. I like a lot. I like, a, I like parts of everybody. I wish it could be like Frankenstein and I could pull this part and this part and put them together and create. Uh, again, I like, the fact that, I like the fact that Trump eschews all jargon. Um, the reason why you find him charming is because he says things the way a guy at a bar would say it. And it's kind of entertaining. Although it's repetitive, he is very repetitive without specifics. He, without any specifics, you become repetitive. Um, you're like a classic rock band with three hits. You know, you go from fairground to fairground. His are China, immigration, that guy's an idiot. That's his hit. But he speaks to you. I think Rubio is the most articulate uh, in... in uh, but he seems to be, he seems every debate to keep getting younger. I don't understand that. But uh, I like Kasich, except Kasich was a bit strange in the last debate. Yeah, I, I said before, I said he's, he's like the guy in front of you at the, uh, at the rental car uh, center, mad that it's not a convertible Sebring. And you just, you just flew, flew in an all night flight, and you just want to get your car, but he's demanding his convertible Sebring. He had that look. It's like, can't you just take the hard top? We all want to go home. <laughs> anyway. Oh, well played. Uh, Greg, it's been an honor to have you here. You're invited back as many times as you'd like. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, if you'll please remain in your seats for just one moment while Greg and his guests uh, clear the room, that'd be fantastic. And if you don't have a book, you can buy them in the lobby or you can buy them in the museum store. Uh, Greg will sign as many as you want. And so enjoy yourself the rest of your evening and come back to see us again. Thank you. You can go. You're good to go, sir.